Hello Health 230 students, this is Brian Clark. Today I will be lecturing on chapter number 8, Energy Balance and Body Composition. And before we dig into the material, I want to talk about a very simplistic example. You see on the screen in front of you a picture of a wood pile on the left, a campfire on the right. And as we look at that wood pile, all of us can very easily understand that the size of the wood pile is exclusively, and I want to emphasize that word exclusively, the size of that wood pile is exclusively determined by the amount of wood that is either put onto the wood pile or the amount of wood that is removed from the wood pile. So as a person cuts wood and puts wood on the wood pile, the amount of energy becomes greater. The amount of energy within that wood pile becomes greater. As we are utilizing that wood to, say for example, burn a campfire or to have a campfire, then the size of that wood pile and the amount of energy within that wood pile is getting smaller. Now I know that may seem like a, a very almost um, absurdly simplistic example, but you can think of your body weight as being that absurdly simple because your body weight is exclusively determined by energy in versus energy out just as the size of that wood pile is exclusively determined by the amount of wood that it that, that is either put on it or taken away from it your body weight is ex is exclusively determined by the amount of energy that goes in versus the amount of energy that goes out. And I want you applying that general premise to everything that you learn in chapter 8 and 9. Because if you understand that general premise and you apply it to the knowledge that you're going to gain, then it is going to enable you to, it's going to give you amazingly good perspective. And when you have good perspective on how weight is gained versus how weight is lost, it will enable you to convey information to patients, to, to convey it to them in a manner that is usable. Now, speaking of information that is usable, determining whether or not a person will gain weight or lose weight is amazingly easy to calculate. Now, on the left-hand side of your screen there, you see an advertisement for a heart rate monitor. And I don't mean to give any undue advertisement to Walmart because you can find heart rate monitors anywhere. Walmart, Target, Amazon, the list is endless. And many of those heart rate monitors will estimate. It, it has been my experience that they are very good estimations. So these heart rate monitors can very accurately estimate the amount of energy that a person burns because they will tell us how many calories a person burns within a given period of time. So if a person wears the heart rate monitor for an hour, we can determine how many calories the person burns in that hour. Or if they wear it for a day, we can determine how many calories they've burned for a day. Now on the right hand side, you will see Diet Analysis Plus. That is the software that I'm requiring you to purchase and utilize in this class. And these dietary analysis softwares, regardless of whether it's Diet Analysis Plus or another diet analysis software, they can very specifically quantify the amount of energy in foods. So by using the diet analysis software, you can determine how much energy or how many calories is being ingested. So if a person knows how many calories is being expended through basal metabolic rate, as well as physical activity, um, and, and we, don't, we don't even need to say that. All, all we need to say is if, if a person knows how many calories or how much energy is being burned in a given day, and that person also knows how much energy is being brought in to the body through food, then very quickly we can make a determination as to whether or not a person is in a caloric surplus, in which case they would be gaining weight, or a caloric deficit, in, in which case they would be losing weight. It truly is that simple. And if you can wrap your brain around that simplistic principle, it will enable you to give good information to pat patients about how to manage their body weight.
All right, I'm going to move fairly quickly through the remainder of the material because it is pretty straightforward. Um, I've touched on all of this. I do want you to know the difference between satiation and satiety. Uh, they are not the same. Satiation is the feeling of fullness or satisfaction that occurs during a meal. So if you're eating and um, you start feeling full and um, you don't need to eat, eat any longer, that's satiation. That occurs during a meal or immediately at the end of a meal. Uh, satiety, on the other hand, that's the feeling that we have in between meals that reminds us not to eat again. Here you see figure 8-2 and this is a, a good illustration of the biofeedback mechanisms that determine when we get hungry and, and ultimately when we eat. Uh, on this slide it's worth pointing out that protein is the most satiating and um, that Interestingly, high fat foods, which have a lot of calories in them, they oftentimes enhance people to eat more. Or not enhance, <laughs> pardon me, entice. Um, they entice people to eat more. And um, that's because, evolutionarily speaking, when we're exposed to high energy density foods, uh, our body says, hey, that's, that's a place where we can get a lot of energy with very little work, with... Um, uh, very, very little expenditure on our part, so that's something that we want to do. However, because food is so readily available in our society, that's not necessarily always a good thing. Actually, it's usually not a good thing. In figure 8-3, you see a very simplistic example of, um, of, of energy density and how sometimes uh, foods with uh, or, or very small volumes of food can pack a pretty pretty big punch on how many calories they have. Uh, also, it is worth noting that the hypothal hypothalamus controls hunger, controls whether or not you are making decisions as to whether or not to eat, and that, that largely has to do with, with hormones. I've already touched on this. Um, that's just saying exactly what I was saying earlier. Uh, in figure 8-4, you're going to see a breakdown of uh, of normal caloric expenditure, about 50 to 65 percent of caloric expenditure on a given day is going to be from basal metabolism. That's just taking the body taking care of business, uh, providing energy to the brain, providing energy for um, for smooth muscle tissue to contract to, to move food through the gastrointestinal system. Um, oops, I skipped over a couple there. Um, about 10% is the thermic effect of food, uh, which which actually is what I just mentioned a moment ago, and um, 30 to 50% is 50. 30 to 50% is physical activities, and of course that number can go significantly higher or it can be very very low if a person is truly sedentary. Um, I will go back. It is worth knowing that RMR because that's an acronym that you will you'll hear and see on a fairly regular basis. That refers to resting metabolic rate. And basal metabolic rate and uh, or um, you know, those, those integral functions that must happen, the energy that's needed to make sure that those integral functions are occurring, uh, it, does, it does sometimes slow with aging. That primarily has to do with the fact that we have less muscle mass as we get older, although that's not necessarily, that doesn't, does not necessarily have to be the case. Uh, when a person is growing or adding muscle mass and bone tissue and connective tissue, basal metabolic rate is going to be higher. Uh, yes, fever does increase it. Stress increases it as well. Um, environmental temperature can, but only minimally. Some things that affect basal metabolic rate on a negative or in a negative manner: um, malnutrition. That's going to slow the rate at which the body utilizes energy. Uh, thyroid thyroid hormones can, to a minimal level, affect basal metabolic rate, um, things like nicotine and caffeine, they increase basal metabolic rate and uh, as, as you can well imagine sleeping is going to slow it down. I, I think that goes without saying. 
physical activity, that's where you're going to get your largest variable in the amount of energy that is expended because you can voluntarily choose to do physical activity. The higher your heart rate or the higher the intensity of an activity, the more energy that you will be burning. Uh, the thermic effect of food, it's estimated that about 10% of, to of the total energy intake is involved with digestion and absorption and adaptive thermogenesis, that is the adjustment in energy expenditure related to environmental changes. So if it is, say for example, very cold outside and you need to shiver to keep warm, that is referred to as adaptive thermogenesis. There are some things that, there actually there's, there's a, a multitude of things that determine uh, caloric expenditure. However, the primary factor that determines how many calories a person is, expended, is expending at a given time is simply how much muscle mass they have and how that muscle mass is being used. Uh, some information on BMI and how it's uh, in um, Miss America pageants that's been going down. Uh, however, that's um, exactly the opposite of what we're seeing in society. The BMI has been going up. Uh, those three numbers, you do, do need to know that BMI is less than 18.5 is considered to be below weight or underweight. Um, underweight is... Um, uh, that's when a person is really going to start being at risk for things like amenorrhea, um, uh, that, that, uh, women not being able to reproduce, although we very seldom see that. Um, overweight is considered to be um, BMIs of greater than 25, and obese is BMIs or uh, BMIs above 30. Those are uh, considered to be obese. You can look at your height and weight on this graph and see where you fall as it relates to being underweight, healthy weight, overweight, or obese. See an illustration there showing um, basically what, what makes up our body weight on a gender scale. And th this is worth slowing down on just a little bit. and. Um, you'll see in figure 8-10 that there are different body shapes and that people do have a tendency to store body fat differently. And we know that those people who are more apple shaped or store their body fat in their upper body, that for whatever reason, and we, we don't fully understand this yet, that those people are at greater risk for certain types of chronic disease, in particular cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's also called central obesity. And you see it illustrated there. That's figure 8-9. That's 8-10. Um, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, basically, the, the higher your, your waist circumference, um, the higher your BMI is going to be. Uh, in figure 8-11, you're going to see the different types of, of measurement methods of body composition. And uh, I will point out the one on the top right-hand side, um, or the, the thing that kind of looks like an egg where someone sits down in it. And that is progressi progressively becoming more and more common. It's called, it's called um, plasmography, and that's, it does an amazingly good job of estimating body fat percentage. There we go. Actually, um, there is figure 8-11, and in the top right-hand corner you see what's called the bod pod. All right, that shows or illustrates um, increases in risk for t certain types of chronic disease, and um, you know, see those listed here. Let's see, I'm on page on uh, slide 32. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, very quickly uh, touch on anorexia nervosa as well as bulimia because those are the two uh, primary points that, that we need to talk about. Anorexia, simply that is the um, that is uh, when a person 
does not eat an adequate amount of calories to maintain their body weight and over time that can lead to very significant weight losses and then there's the condition called bulimia that's where a person binges and purges where they take in way too many calories at once and then they void their body by vomiting and if um, of course if a person is vomiting the food up well th th those are calories that are not absorbed alright thank you for your attention in chapter number eight